Excellent. So I mean, essentially, we have three rock stars here for your viewing pleasure, and I'd love to hear what they have to say. Uh, so um, to begin with, uh, just to make sure that everyone knows what we're talking about, uh, I'd like you to explain at a high level just what does a data and AI transformation program involve. Um, Tracy, do you want to go first? Absolutely. I think uh, all good data programs start with a, a strategy that's, that's a data and AI strategy that's, of course, linked to the broader enterprise strategy. And so using um, that strategy to drive, you know, a, you know, I would call it a multidimensional approach. So talent, technology, process reinvention, um, all the different aspects of how the, the value chain would be impacted uh, by a program are, are where I tend to at least start the focus and, and then drill in where there's opportunities. So I like that you have a strategy before you start diving into the details. That does seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, we're certainly going to cover like the, the talent stuff, the process stuff, the technology stuff uh, throughout the session today. Um, Gabriel, do you want to talk me through like what the goals are of um, yeah. a transformation program? Yeah. So when it comes down to data and analytics, there's so many different ways that you can use these approaches, technologies, and capabilities to change a business. Um, and so first and foremost, what we like to do when thinking about the data strategy, which I totally agree with Tracy, but is to ask, what are the use cases that we want to explore that may have value or, or are hypothesized to have value for the transformation of the business? And so once we have a good set and understanding of what those use cases look like, what families of use cases, what are the highest priority opportunities, we can start to look at actually what are the uh, sort of proof of concepts or minimal viable demonstration projects that we can do that will start to show that a use case actually is solvable and it's a use case that when solved can have business value. And so that's probably the next step in this process is really going to define the, sp the scope of the use cases and then ultimately demonstrate that there is transformational value and potential when they're uh, built up as a proof of concept. Okay, I like the idea that um... Anything you do, uh, there ought to be some kind of use case where you've got uh, business value. Um, Christian, do you want to add to that? Like, have you got any specific examples of projects that might have some business value? Well, actually, Gable can talk more on a project that that really de uh, developed uh, business value or generated business value. I think it depends on which organization we're talking about. Uh, so we're 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 in life sciences, right? That's the scope of what our conversations here. But they are vastly different. And they have vastly different uh, value chain elements um, and the opportunities with both uh, data transformations, but AI driven data transformations or utilization of technology are vastly different across that value chain. So I think it's it it uh, it depends very much on to Tracy's point. What are you trying to achieve at a corporate level? What are you trying to achieve at, to achieve at different um, business unit levels? Um, I'm uh, just to start the juices a little bit. I'm not always in agreement with Gabriel in terms of the MVP because you need to think at the end. My, my, I've seen so many that you know, death by pox, if you will, that never take off to any scalability. So scaling has to be thought into it uh, uh, in order to uh, to generate real value. So, yeah, yeah. Um, well, to, just to build on that, j just one second. Um, I think you're totally right, Christian, that scaling a POC into a full large scale deployment is tricky. But I also see this as an opportunity to kind of try out a bunch of shots on goal, see which ones are working, and then ultimately choose the ones that seem the most promising and the most scalable, right? Um, so I also expect that, you know, at least half the POCs shouldn't escalate if you're taking the right amount of risk here, because uh, a substantial number of those should have challenges or scalability factors that you don't think you could undertake so sorry by poc here we're talking about is proof of concept this is some kind of proof of, of concept back. sorry yeah already going to my lingo <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah so um it's one thing to have a proof of concept and just see is this thing going to work but getting something through to like a production product where it's got to scale that's that's a very different kettle of fish i think especially for uh, our audience here Richard, right because there's exactly there is a lot of data scientists uh, I mean, I've exhausted my fair share of data scientists on stuff where they had to do a tremendous amount of data engineering, right? And if you only do it for the sake of the POC, your data foundation for driving scalable AI is not going to be there. So 
So, so th then uh, back to the uh, people, the processes, and the technology by by people, right? So. Uh, absolutely, yeah. The, there's one thing where you've got a small data set and you can do things in a spreadsheet, and yeah. there's a <laughs> thing where you've got vast amounts of data and it's some kind of uh, giant project. Yeah, uh, you're going to need to switch, swap out your technology at that point. Um, okay, so um, Tracy, do you want to? Actually, there's maybe a question for all three of you. Tracy, do you want to go first? Are there different kinds of transformation programs needed for different areas of the pharmaceutical industry? Like, can you just talk me through like what would happen in different parts of the business? Yeah, I mean, I would say that irrespective of what part of the business you're in, I think those that are winning are making a deep investment into an enterprise upskilling, right? So thinking about how almost every individual, their role will be changed, whether it's automated, whether it's augmented, you know, how that is going to change the way they think about their work and really transform get some stickiness on what I would call a no regret, right? Like there's many things that that we're learning that, that can be incorporated to make ourselves more efficient, um, augment the work that I'm doing, get me to 60% or 80%, right? Learning a new skill, because if I've spent the entirety of my role, let's say I work in regulatory filing, if I start, I, I start from the very beginning, I take the FDA's template, I fill this out, and this is the work I know. If I'm changing the game and saying I can create 60% of your uh, your regulatory filing document, the new skill is proofing, approving, and reviewing that 60% and amending it to 100%. This is a complete change, right? We're, we're taking people that have had, you know, a technical or subject matter expertise. So I think it starts with that. I think there's also an enormous component of thinking about the balance of the, the full perspective, right? How do we think about these problems in a way that, you know, the traversal value, right? I'm seeing organizations where the lessons we're learning in that regulatory filing case are not different than what a commercial organization is going to see when they're filing for um, LR, MLR, right? So, so getting those documents or the um, you know marketing materials approved through the FDA so that commercials or, or anything that we would give to a healthcare provider are approved, right? This is not a different muscle. So I think I focus a lot on what is the muscle that we're building, as well as the technological infrastructure that's going to be able to support this transformation. And then the last piece of this is really about how do you create the connective tissue across your organization? Because those learnings that, you know, very, very typical, the, one of the most vexing issues of our industry is that commercial and supply chain and R&D and back office have always operated in these beautiful silos, right? I, I really think the unlock of that value is these traversal use cases, right? And, and while I do believe the greatest value, and, and I know that Gabriel and Christian will talk about this, is in R&D, if you don't thread the needle across the rest of the value chain, I think that's where, you know, you're, you're leaving an opportunity on the table for your shareholders. So, so thinking the, about the holistic view as part and parcel to the broader transformation. That's really interesting. Um and I can certainly see how if yeah, what you do is regulatory filing and you're filling in all these documents all the time, then having AI do that for you and reviewing it, that's going to be quite a culture shift. And so you do need to invest the time in making sure that all your staff have the right skills just to understand like what's going on with the AI. And also like the idea that, yeah, R and D is kind of it's like the cool bit of pharma, but actually there's gonna be a lot of value unlocked by just talking getting those people to talk to their colleagues in supply chain or whatever exactly. um oh man no talking to your colleagues in other departments so it's, it's hard work <laughs> um all right super uh so maybe we'll get into uh some of the details on people then um so i'd like to know who the key stakeholders are in any kind of transformation program um gabriel do you want to take this yeah yeah it's, it's a good question it, and, and and it kind of dovetails well into what tracy just said because when christian and i we work a lot together we, we go into companies and we look at transformational projects that are being undertaken um we find that first of all technology it feels like a technology project but it's probably actually a people and process project as much if not more so and that if transformation projects struggle it's because they probably thought about it as too much of a technology project and not enough of a business transformation. So there's business process change. There's 
Uh, of course, the engineering, the data science to build the technology, right? And we can talk about that more. Um, but there's also, you know, ethics and compliance and of its patient data, there's privacy and legal and IT security. And sometimes even the stakeholders who own the data set that's being transformed have to be involved. Oftentimes the downstream stakeholders who are going to benefit from that data set now being available to them um, are going to be involved. And so you oftentimes have this multifaceted team that will involve many different functions in the company that don't always come together. They don't speak the same language. They don't have a common level of technical understanding about the problems at hand. Going back to Tracy's point of the more technical literacy the organization as a whole has, the more we can bring together these diverse teams and have them have some semblance of an understanding of what the other folks do in that regard. And so, you know, this is this is new muscles, it's new connective tissue, but oftentimes you have many of these functions coming around the table in order to assess, strategize, and implement any of these transformational activities. I love that point that actually you need everyone in the organization to have some degree of data literacy, of AI literacy, just so that people can have an intelligent conversation with each other about what you're doing and um, what your goals are. Um, uh, Christian, do you want to add anything to that on like who needs to do what in some sort of in the transformation program? I think the uh, my my learning colleague here uh, did it well. I, you know, it is people uh, that we're augmenting, and, and Tracy touched much about how people will be proofing the AIs, right? So it's humans in the loops or it's co-pilot thinking or something. So we're not we're not trying to uh, remove these kind of things. And, and, and that depends on where you are in the value chain, right? There are some use cases where you do not need a human in the loop or the, the, the technology can do it awesomely without us, right? And then there is the more sensitive stuff. It's probably going to take a while before anyone wants to do a filing based on something that the AI just did. And similarly, when you touch to, to Gabriel's point, the more sensitive data types uh, that are humanly generated, right? Where, where it's it's human data, um, you need the human in the loop and you need the human in the driver's seat is enabled or augmented as, as, as Tracy talks about uh, by the technology. It's an okay. interesting question because we, with very little effort, we're able to show you can get through one document at 60%, right? And, and the immediate next question is, what does it take to get to 100%? And I think the question that we're asking is, do you want to get to 100% or do you want to get confidence at 60% and have them say, okay, I trust it, I believe in it, and I and I, I consider this another tool in my toolkit that's it's accretive to my value, not something that I feel like is going to take my role, right? And so that that mindset shift around, wow, I can work on the things that I like, I enjoy, that I that I actually went to school for, right? And and not have to do these things that aren't so interesting. I, I'm seeing a little bit of a, let's say, slower adoption by design to get some built-in change management, which I think is really refreshing. We're, we're, we're having these discussions with our uh, third wheel, Gabriel and I. Um, on should we actually go directly for document generation by Gen AI? And, and, and he's a proponent of this. And I'm more, uh, let's do structured authoring by using, uh, you know, built towards these components similar to what you're alluding to. Let's get to the 80%. But we both share the same job to be done to, uh, to kind of uh, paraphrase uh, Clayton Christensen, right? We, 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 we both want to achieve a technology augmented avenue for generating these documents. I'm just more a believer. Um, you should be here, right? But but the, the 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 fastest route is through people, not around people. So I, I'm I'm with you. Let's go for the eighty percent because that that uh, that ultimate gain uh, in terms of the value that you generate by going for the hundred is probably not going to be there if uh, time to market is your uh, KPI, which it is for most of us. Gabriel, I can see you wanted to jump in there. So it sounds like um, Tracy and Christian both want um, AI to assist with writing documents. Are you keen on having complete AI generation? No, no. I mean, you know, um, first of all, even if it's 100% on one document, the chance of it being 100% on all documents is very low. And so, you know, we, we really couldn't trust that. It's the same reason why we can't trust Dr. Google. It's the same reason why we can't trust a lot of technology. 
to do the 100% job. And we're, we're very far away from that. So I think that, you know, working alongside of AI, you know, there's that saying about radiologists, right? Um, AI is not going to replace radiologists, but radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists who don't. And I think that that same concept can be brought into many of the operational steps that are being, uh, you know, enhanced with Gen AI. That Gen AI applications will, uh, you know, work alongside humans, and those humans will replace those who refuse to, right? And so, with time, there's a lot there. Absolutely. Okay, so um, yeah, it, it's going to be people who are more productive rather than people who are now out of a job because the AI is taking the job. That seems like a, a happy situation for everyone. Um, I'd like to switch to talking a little bit about technology. It seems like, okay, you've got all these new AI technologies and it doesn't seem like it's just a case of buying in a new product. Um, so what do you need to do in order to um, adopt these new technologies? Um, all right, uh, Tracy, you've not spoken for a while. Yeah, I think it's a, a couple of things. So there's a, you know, if we think about where we've been over the last 18 months, uh, most organizations, I would call it the 80th percentile of organizations I work with, have brought some version of, let's call it a, a, a chat GPT or similar in-house. They put it inside their firewall fence. They've rolled it out to some degree. They put some structure around it. Um, it's becoming part of the fabric, right? And so, so that technology, you know, has, has sort of proven uh, to be one that that I'm seeing some good stickiness around. And then now I see that a couple of things are happening from a technological perspective. So one is, yes, that's great, and now everybody's gone. Okay, now I need to, you know, um, I, I hear people sort of overly use the term fine tuning, um, which is uh, a little bit of a, a pet peeve of mine. Um, but I, I think it's like, how are you taking your organizational data? How are you using it to take one of the large or small uh, language models that's out there and making it specific to your organization? And that's where we're seeing the things that are really, truly transformative, right? So looking at smaller models, um, Cohere or Writer that are fit for purpose, doing something that is, is really accretive to to a specific task or that is brought in with a client specific internal um, information. So really, really valuable as it relates to some of that. Um, I also think that there's a broader perspective as I think about this, the, the models that are out there. I'm, I'm currently tracking about 74 models that we consider the, the major models that, that organizations could, should consider. But I think we learned so much in the cloud journey, right? The idea that someone's going to go single model, you know, it, it's, it's almost impossible. I, I would be surprised that anybody ends up that way. So going into it with this idea that there's going to probably be a best of breed, and that when you build it out, that having some flexibility, we call it a, a switchboard format, so that if another model is proving to be better when you've done your A-B testing and comparing the two, that you can swap one, that if you needed to swap a model out because for some reason that you felt that it wasn't aligned to your responsible AI strategy. So, so I think it's about how you're thinking of what you implement in there. Um, continuously, you know, testing, you know, fit for purpose models like BioNemo and others as we start to think about, you know, the R&D space, you know, I think there's an enormous amount there. Um, and, and I will go so far as to say that a lot of companies ask, you know, should I be building my, my own large, large language model out? And I'd be very curious what Gabriel and, and Christian think about this, but I, I've not yet come across an instance where I've, I've uh, ever thought to make that recommendation based on what is available and the emerging trends around this. I think um, I've never seen a situation where, you know, use cases or pox like Gabriel was talking about um, the feasibility or whether something would pay off or was was a, a smart technological innovation. It might be an answer. I'll say, you know, six months ago, the answer was no. Now the capabilities are so high that the answer becomes that it's affordable or cost effective or sustainable. So so it's not necessarily something where it's sort of a one and done. It's much more of a continuum of where you're mapping your use cases to the technological capabilities, the APIs, you know, the, the methods to make these you know, perform in a way that's changing um, at the pace of, of where the technology is. <laughs> a lot to unpack there. Um, and so, okay, so maybe we'll come back to um, adopting technology later. There's a few things I want to just 
uh, query you about that. So one thing you said that was interesting was um, that going for smaller models might be better. So there's been a big thing over the last few years where it's like every new large language model is getting bigger and bigger, more parameters, and it's getting fancier and fancy, and you get better text output. What makes you suggest? What makes you think that smaller models are better? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. So one is that they're more affordable, they're cheaper to run from a sustainability perspective, but a lot of times a smaller model is going to deliver on exactly what you need without having to, um, you know, drag the cost um, or, or be able to, you know, drive the type of solution. So, so I love this idea of, of a smaller model um, really, you know, for specific use cases or, or, or for, for certain utilities um, being ones that are, are easier and cheaper to utilize. Um, I think they, they can be, you know, I'm not saying that you need sort of like an entire model garden, um, but I, I definitely think that you, you need to be considerate of the fact that, you know, the answer isn't always these enormous models. Actually, that's interesting. I mean, because like GPT-4 can write, write text in any style you want. But if you've got a chat bot with your customers, you don't want it to start writing poetry. Exactly. <laughs> you just want it to respond about your product. Um, okay, so I can see how that's that makes sense. Um, so the other thing you said was um, people talk about fine tuning too much. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 um, the exact definition of fine tuning um, and the idea of what most people I think are referring to is that if you think about a, a large language model like a chat GPT or an anthropic, right, it's, it's not specific, right? It doesn't have anything about my organization in there. So if I ask it questions about what's my HR policy or anything like that, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, tuned to that, right? So this idea that we know these large models need to be specific for an organization, a policy, an approach, um, or procedure, right? So let's let's assume I want it to write some Python code. It's going to write a generic template for Python code. But do you want to apply Accenture's rules around how we want to, you know, style or you know, what are our our um, architectural standards? That's a different story. Is that fine tuning? That's actually probably RAG or or other methods to do that. Again, I'm always going to rotate onto what's a cost effective solution to achieve um, the, the outcomes versus what's most expensive. And, and fine tuning is, is not a cheap route to, uh, to get there in many cases. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So there's different ways of getting that sort of customized output and fine tuning is horribly expensive in, in many cases, unless you've got your own cloud <laughs> service. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, so uh, before this, before we digress into uh, generative AI, we were talking about adopting technology. So maybe let's get back to that. Uh, Gabriel, do you have any more advice on how you can uh, assist the adoption and usage of new technology? That's a good question. You know, um, the Gen AI revolution has certainly pushed the boundaries there because it exploded with complexity and excitement and had folks, you know, Tracy, I'll bet you your job didn't exist a year and a half ago, right? Um, you know, it just exploded because all across organizations, they were keen to try this out and see the power for their business. Um, ironically, one thing we also we've seen, which is just worth commenting on is with the increasing of responsibility around sustainability, and then you have the deployment of these models so broadly, um, you know, there is this sort of uh, two ships crossing in the night in a sense moment here because the sustainability ship is going in an absolutely different direction than the, than the AI ship now, right? Um, and that some companies have very hard metrics on compute and on um, carbon footprints, and these sustainability uh, metrics are in stark contrast to the promise and the challenge an opportunity of using Gen AI, right? So it's worth saying that. Um, you know, at, at, when I was at Novartis, where I was previously for four years with Data42, um, we spent a lot of time trying to be sure that our teams were um, appropriately skilled in various technical elements. We had, um, you know, skill building groups and we had um, definitely uh, sort of uh, uh, engineering uh, sort of lunch and learn opportunities so that folks would be exposed to all sorts of new technologies and learn from their peers or other guest speakers about these technologies as they were coming to bear. Because we think a culture of learning and growth and development is essential 
for a healthy engineering organization and data science organization. And therefore we tried to uh, you know, sponsor this and encourage our data engineers and data scientists and others to become involved in, and, and to learn about these things. So, um, you know, just back to the idea about how do you build a, you know, a technical organization that's effective. Um, yeah, I love the idea that once you've got new technology, you can't just buy it, you need to train everyone on how to use it and oh, yeah. make them understand like why it's important and how it's going to benefit their jobs. Otherwise it's like, oh, it's a new thing. I'm just going to ignore it. So uh, I do like that. Um, Christian, do you have anything to add on that? Um, uh, what advice? When, when, um, you know, during the pandemic or just post pandemic, there was this joke running around who transformed the organization, Corona or your CDO. It's sort of the same with, with uh, Gen AI, I think, right? So, uh, so to Gabriel's point, the world has changed now because uh, C-suite people within pharma are not brought up within technology, right? They're not. This is, this, they are different skill sets for becoming uh, what they are. And suddenly their kids are playing with chat GPT. It's pervasive. So I think, uh, Tracy, that, that, that um, if I should paraphrase what I think uh, would happen is that Gen AI is going to be a deployed to to your point um, pervasively across the organization. I actually think it's going to be the use cases that are, or or, or the uh, the more common one that crosses the organization, but it enables thinking around uh, AI in a totally different way. And instead of focusing on the fine tuning of of LLMs, it's probably going to be utilization of deep uh, AI within the domains. Right. So in in Gables and my past, we've been meddling around with these clinical development data which today seem vast but in my mind actually are a complete data void relative to what we will see in the future when when sensors are going to be brought into pe uh, to people in clinical trials and we will see uh, streaming of data uh, changing the, the gamut fully right and now it's becoming okay to do it because you can you can uh, allow yourself to say the word ai just don't need, I mean, we have, you have uh, smart people to tell you which, but it's, it's okay to talk about uh, AI now also in, in the deep knowledge base of, uh, for instance, uh, research or clinical development. So it may, may not be LNMs. And honestly, I think, I don't care. I, 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 it's not the technology I'm in love with. It's the problem it solves for me. Yeah. I like that. So, um, you don't just adopt new technology just for the sake of it. You always really want to have link it back to whatever business problem you're trying to solve. Um, so I'm kind of curious about uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, I know it's very heavily covered by regulations. How does that affect the transformation process? Uh, come on, Christian, do you want to go again? Yeah, but, but, but maybe it's a little bit back to uh, traces in my debate on whether you want to go for the 100% or the 80%, right? So, so most stuff in pharma um, is actually about making sure that there's traceability in what you do and that you do what you say you do. That's it, right? Just bringing everything around DXP down to something that is sensible. If you utilize technology in a sensible way, it will probably get you a, a, lo a, a, a long way because most of these technologies have traceability built in. There is data governance around it, uh, who touches what, right? And there's a if you are really cool as an organization, you have lineage from the end result back to where it started. That's not even using AI, it's just you're using the component that, that you have here, and then you start using AI on top of it. Many life science organizations, to my knowledge, are not even close to becoming at that stage where their different data silos are stitched together. So, so there's, there's, a, there's an opportunity there. Uh, so that's more the data strategy than the how do we use AI on top of that strategy? And again, linking back to what I mentioned earlier, it's easy to do it within your, your curated data set. Then you can have your data scientists have fun with that data. But if that's the finite data set that you have available and your problems are not solved by your data, but the larger data sets, uh, you need the stitching in a sensible manner. That's back to the data strategy. Okay. Um, yeah. But back to your question, Richie, for a second. Um, what about the compliance and regulatory sides of biopharma? I just want to touch upon that as well. And I think Christian was going there, but um, uh, they're immensely complicated as well because of our obligations to privacy, to respecting the consent provided by the patients, 
Um, let's just take the consent problem as an example, right? The average pharma company has a global consent document that they use to define how they will approach consent for all trials. That gets translated into a local copy that happens at the country level. So now my global trial, which has sites in Brazil, Romania, and the US and Germany, um, now has four different versions of that consent. And then that in turn gets specified at the hospital or the treatment, treatment site. So you have so many layers of complexity that basically for the thousand patients in my trial, I probably have, I don't know, 100, 200 different versions of my consent document that have been signed. And so as a result, you then have really complexity around how do you respect the consent that the patients gave you, et cetera. And so the, the, the notion about compliance and the regulatory side and the legal application side is enormous. And one thing I do want to raise, because your audience should hear about this, is the AI Act in Europe is going to have global implications. And that's going to put a lot of what we're talking about today onto its head because all or most of these applications will need to go undergo an analysis of their degree of compliance with that act. And in many cases, they're going to have to go through additional steps in order to be compliant, which that's a major find for those who don't comply. And, and that's going to, I think, change the way we deploy these technologies dramatically. Okay, so um, between the two, I think um, you both seem to agree that like transparency and having some kind of reproducibility is incredibly important in whatever you do because the regulators need to understand what's going on. Um, Gabriel, do you want to talk a little bit more about the AI Act and just what the, some of the, the key points are? Yeah, yeah so, so Christian and I have been spending a whole bunch of time learning about this and trying to figure out how it plays. Tracy, I'm sure it comes up in your work as well. But really, there's this risk triage to understand what is the risk level in which, you know, and AI is, first of all, it's not just Gen AI, it's not just AI, it's any algorithm now falls into this risk uh, evaluation. And you have different tiers of risk from, you know, minimal risk all the way up to maximal risk. Maximal risk being uh, AI that directly impacts humans, right? Um, and so this could be facial recognition tools sitting on the side of a road for the police to monitor populations, or it could be, you know, uh, software that runs inside medical devices and so this triangle triage suggests that if you're in the top layers of that triangle you are expected to go through a whole bunch of compliance checks to both have sops and clarity on the data you've trained with and testing and transparency about the performance and all sorts of aspects of that model that have to be both documented and approved by a competent authority in europe now this doesn't just apply to ai scientists sitting in Europe or technology being deployed in Europe, any technology that has a footprint that ever walks into the European territory has to comply with this. It's like GDPR. So the Europeans have now set a standard that will globally determine a lot of this AI operation. And uh, you know, in January of 2026, the fines will start to come for those who don't comply. And so, you know, while we see incredible enthusiasm behind the adoption of this AI, there's going to be a little bit of a consolidation that has to take place where we say, okay, we've got to be careful where we're deploying, deploying AI, be thoughtful about it, and make sure that we're doing it in ways that are going to be compliant come the January 2026 timeframe. Okay, it just sounds like this is incredibly like um, wide-reaching regulation then. Mm -hmm. um, so, Tracy, since you're based in the U.S., um, uh, are there any regulations that you're looking at in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, similar to what we saw with GDPR, right? So we'll start to see some of what is going on in Europe uh, likely translate. I think the FDA is tracking quite closely the report that they published uh, last May, um, again, leading to many of the core concepts that, that Gabrielle mentioned, right? There, there's not exact prescriptions, if you will, on how to handle every single use case. It's really about how do you triage and determine and and um, go that route. I also am quite bullish. I think, um, as Christian mentioned, you know, GXP or validated systems are things we've we've been dealing with forever. Right. So so I think as a broader industry, this idea around documentation, transparency, explainability, all the things that, that we would consider at the heart of a responsible AI strategy are, are kind of in the, you know, the, the DNA, if you will, to, to use, a, use a, an overused term that, 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 that uh, pharmaceuticals, life sciences, biopharma, med tech, we've all been, um, you know, embracing that for many years. So I think, um, you know, the, the difference here is, is that we'll continue to watch. I think the other part of it is watching litigation. 
um, because it's going to be an amazing guidepost and in the way that those um, regulations and those triages are interpreted um, and something that that every organization should be um, quite, um, you know, sensing and watching um, and, and hopefully, you know, collaborating with their peers, right? And, and, and having discussions about, you know, not not to uh, take any secret sauce out of it, but you know how do they create sort of um, consortiums and, and and guidance around how they're they're implementing um, to the degree that that the FDA and other regulatory agencies will guide us. Okay, well, Tracy, um, just to add one point, Tracy. Um, historically, what I've observed is the best data science happens in the less regulated systems. So you're not taking a GXP system and putting a bunch of data scientists in there to go play around with AI. You're doing it in the unregulated side for secondary Great. use or other places. Yeah. And so um, I think AI likes to, and, and data scientists like to dabble with data and do proof of concepts and, and play. And, and ultimately they have to eventually work in systems that are uh, compliant, um, but it's not their natural tendency to go there. And so now we're putting those people in scope for regulations, which they've hitherto been able to avoid in some ways. You know? Yeah, I think you bring up a great point. I mean, even even when you're you've not worked or you're not working on a validated system, I, I tend to find in comparison to other industries, if I compare it to consumer products or retail or other other organizations, you know, we've seen such an injection of uh, C-suite leaders that have come out of industry um, and had a little bit of a, a whipsaw moment of of not understanding what a validated system is. Um, even on non-validated, I feel like the the broader culture. Um, is quite oriented towards some of the spirit of of responsible AI, if 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 I may. Yeah. yeah, with the with the you know a little bit subtlety around what we started out discussing that <clears throat> data in different silos of pharma have vastly different criticalities yeah. in terms of what we're discussing here, right? So anything that touches human data is very very different from production data. Agreed. All right. Uh, and then there is the, uh, the, the the more operational aspects of of this that this brings about in terms of how do you actually get your um, AI through the notified bodies, right? So Gabriel points, there's a 85 percent plus um, uh, similarity between medical device regulations and and the proposed AI Act regulations. So it's exactly the same thinking that goes into it. It's exactly the same type of documentation you need to provide in order to get it. And it's exactly the same notified bodies that need to approve it. <clears throat> so so there are some some things that uh, specifically pharma needs to figure out how to do. I think, Gabriel, is, isn't it fair to say that that your, your prior uh, job in terms of, of uh, you know, risk-based anonymization of, of the data rendered it better as kind of a playground for figuring out how to do this? Because you have de-risked it. Right back to you. Yeah, yeah. Control. Right. Um, well, not to get. Go ahead. Right, as opposed to to running it on on on, on pure primary data. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, companies will take creative ways to address the compliance requirements around data, because oftentimes, of course, you can comply with the regulations, or alternatively, you can take a data set and remove it from being in scope of the regulations, and then you're complying. So, for example. A lot of companies use data synthetic data as a means of building methods and testing methods, which is you are taking actual human data, making twins or non-human copies of that, which are like a human, like you've seen synthetic people on their faces, right? Um, you can do the same with DNA. You can do the same with medical records. And so based on that, we can actually train and build methods and, and, and validate methods. Um, and, and that can be a powerful alternative to actually having um, uh, the actual data, which, you know, the synthetic data is no longer germane to the compliance requirements that the original data was. Yeah, Gabriel, I think that's awesome. I, I love this concept. And I think for listeners that are not thinking about synthetic data, um, you know, any of us that have worked in rare, rare diseases and understand the importance of, of synthetic data because a population is so small, right? It would be um, very, very difficult to, um, to to get a full trial that successfully through. Um, I think I'm I'm so excited about that that the synthetic data, which I, I don't think is a, a new term, although it's it's quite uh, more fashionable now. Um, I, I think it's something that every every life sciences and med tech organization really needs to think about as a a very important pillar to how they they think about the next steps in their journey for AI. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So one thing I'm hearing is that there, in different parts of the business, there are much stricter requirements than others. So if you're trying to uh, like adopt AI, is it better to start in the less regulated areas of the business, just kind of build up those skills in a less critical situation? Or is it something where every department's doing this in parallel? I think that's what's naturally is happening, but that may not be where the most value lies, right? So back to Strategy's opening comment, uh, these things should be following the aspirations laid out in the strategies, right? Uh, and if your, your bulk of your value in the foreseeable future lies in, in another part that is heavily regulated, uh, that's just the, uh, the kind of the straitjacket, uh, if you will, that you need to carry to generate that value, right? Okay, yeah. so again, it's like long term, you're going back to the, the business uh, value. I think, Sorry, so. I, think, I think most mature organizations are actually, uh, if you will, uh, transforming at the core. Most immature technology, immature organizations are, are transforming very far from the, I'm a medical doctor, right? Very far from the heart, uh, where your pinky might be okay. That's not going to transform your organization. So, so it's, it's a matter of if you're very literate about the transformation element, I want to become uh, a different organization at the end of this route. And by the way, that route never stops. Um, then you need to, to touch the, the expensive part of your outfit. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I'd like to talk about some success stories. We need, we need something to cheer us up. So I'd just like to hear some examples of, um, yeah, how, what companies have done something cool and won by improving their data or AI capabilities? Yeah. Uh, go on. I can share one. Um, so, so in 2019, Novartis undertook a massive initiative to spend several billion dollars on the creation of AI and data capabilities broadly at the heart of the business but everything from early stage research through development and then into the medical regulatory and launch processes. And they launched about 12 strategic initiatives called Lighthouses, one of which was mine called Data42, where we essentially built out a data platform to house and unify the R&D data assets from across 25 years of experimentation and human trials. And the most valuable and sensitive of those data are the human data because uh, mice are interesting, but they're a somewhat of a tool in the pharma experimental phases. And ultimately, human health and human outcomes are what we are after. And so we built out a massive, massive data asset with about 2,300 trials, um, encompassing around 2 million patient years worth of data. This is both enormous on some scale of things on other scales in healthcare there are bigger data sets but the thing is this is one of the only data sets in the world that has data about how patients do in terms of outcomes how they fare after getting treatments do they benefit from those treatments do they have safety issues and these data are randomized substantially meaning that patients were randomly assigned to get the placebo or the active therapy and thus, these patients also have a lot more uh, value in terms of being able to uh, study. So we launched this platform. We've had um, over a thousand users on the platform and, and hundreds of use cases come through it. Um, and it's been a really interesting experiment to watch because, like I said at the beginning, the transformation requires multiple facets to take place from not just the technology, the business process. So, for example, the fact that clinical trials used to be put into a database and locked down so only a handful of people in the business could see the data in that clinical trial. Now, the fact that these databases have all the clinical trials that's available to all the data scientists and Novartis was made some people's heads explode, you know, because this is a very risky thing to do. And how do you do this and make sure people are using the data responsibly? So we had to engineer all sorts of new governance and data processes and, and business processes to ensure that the data were used responsibly, People understood the ethical expectations of their proper use of the data. And ultimately, we could learn collectively as a company about how to do this safely. And so these are the kind of things that we were able to undertake in that transformation. And you know, while I can't speak in detail about the projects we did, um, we found some unbelievably valuable and interesting use cases that came out of that. And I think we're just reaching the tip of the iceberg, to be honest. 
for having agility with data and the value that can come with it. That is pretty incredible. And I know um, there's maybe a management reflex or po possibly an IT department reflex that if you make data available to all these other teams, you have a rogue employee who does something terrible with it. But yeah, I think if you put in those sort of the gov governance training and the make people understand like what is acceptable to do with this data, then yeah, uh, it can work really well. That's a, that's a great story. Um, uh, Tracy, do you have any stories of success? I think Chris Christian, you might have oh, had Christian? one. I, I saw your hand go up, so I'll let you oh, go first. I, word, uh, to, to, I mean, the, the governance that uh, the Gabriel and company were able to wrap around data for two was actually awesome. Uh, so so you know, there, there were um, safeguards in, in, in what you just alluded to. I have another one. Um, and it goes a little bit back to my uh, my, my kind of fear of debt by POC, uh, proof of concept, right? But with having kind of have an aspiration of we want to change stuff, right? And uh, uh, I've been previously seeing some stuff in terms of how do you generate uh, clinical uh, study reports? You can generate clinical study reports the old fashioned way where everyone's sitting there and writing and evaluating the data and writing and copy pasting from uh, what is called tables, listings and figures. And then there's a lot of reviews happening with a lot of people wasting a lot of time reviewing the same stuff over and over again. And many of these components, if you run big programs, which many companies do, are copy pasted between the different CSRs that are then reviewed component wise, right? So the idea here was to generate that's a big problem right because the, the these things are standing between you and your submission so the the, the faster you can wrap this up the sooner you can uh, submit and intuitively the sooner you get to the market and this is the thing within pharma right so this nifty group of people did something really cool both on technology side but more importantly on the people side so they had pre-reviewed components of this stuff right so so there's a lot of different players involved with reviewing a clinical study report from biostatisticians for uh, clinical operations for medical science and you have it right regulatory they pre-approved components and got a handshake of this is awesome from the component and then populated the the csrs were able to reduce you know 90 percent of the time wasted uh, in time but I'm most impressed about the uh, the, the, the you know, uh, opportunity uh, cost avoided spend of people reviewing the same things and commenting on the same things, which is kind of a snowball of, of ridiculous comments, right? So that's a uh, that's both and 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 then they fine tune it, uh, maybe not the, your way of fine tuning it, but from something that was doable, it's now being scaled, right? So the same dream but pursued differently by, by different technology uh, advancements, but, but still generating the, uh, the, the same business value. And that's, uh, in my mind, a very awesome way of com combining both the processes, which had to be changed, the people, which had to play in a different way, and then the technology that had to change to, to, uh, to scale uh, uh, along the way. That's pretty cool. And I do find it amazing that even now, it's like, it's very difficult to have good commenting processes in a lot of cases i think uh yeah we've all had that experience where like and you write something people. We, and we then there's just across like... life sciences we hire so many smart people right they're really brilliant and then you you uh, you ask them to copy paste that's that's uncomfortable for a bright person they change <laughs> and, and then, because this could sound better right the minute you do these kind of non-valuating changes to any text in any of the material documents that are, goes into a, a submission it's another review, right? So, so this is this is one of the biggest efficiency drivers, both in terms of uh, avoiding lost value, but also in terms of uh, time to market. Okay, yeah, I can see how that would be a huge time saver. It's like, okay, just <laughs> don't change the text; it's going to trigger reviews. Yeah, um, it's or, right? Yes. Richie, I okay, might give yeah. one real quick. I know we're Go probably on. like we had some other examples. I'll share one from supply chain, and one of the ones where I'm seeing the you know the iot sensor world tie into predictive maintenance and i think one of the things we do know is that ai can be extremely effective um you know for those that don't work in the industry um you know yield efficiency and batch effectiveness is is of critical importance you can imagine a batch of of a uh, biologic uh, not being usable or or having a failure where a seal may go or something like this um during the batch and in 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 um in 
it may be unusable. Uh, the the financial impacts of this are, are cataclysmic, right? So so I would say that if you're not thinking about your supply chain and the broader manufacturing process using the AI as you apply the algorithms into that, you know, sort of like not the the most exciting use case around preventative maintenance, but um, uh, one that that I've seen uh, be extremely exciting and some uh, provocative outcomes uh, that that are not boring at all. And, and Tracy, I know, sorry, Rishi, that's also where back to the deep stuff, right? You will probably see a lot of hardware augmentations happening. Exactly. Because suddenly we know how to deal with the data, right? So these sensors are going to be ubiquitous in your value chain because you can do something about it now. Mm -hmm. Oh man, Internet of Things for Pharma. I think that's, that's a whole nother webinar there. But yeah, I do like the idea that, um, yeah, you can use this stuff to stop things breaking and that's probably going to add a lot of value just throughout your supply chain. Um, I just realized we got, a, we got a hard stop in five minutes. So I'm going to switch to audience questions. For anyone in the audience, if you do have a question, uh, we might have time for one or two more. Uh, so uh, this question comes from Sophie saying, I'd love to hear about the future of patient engagement uh, with AI in pharma. I love that one. Um, um, yeah, cool. so, so, so one of the biggest requirements also from FDA actually is make sure the patients understand what you're exposing them to. And it's also part of, of, of the whole thing uh, that we're, we're trying to allude to here. Right? So I think there's a, the, the patients are very different obviously every piece, person is unique. I see. We'll, we, I think we will have uh, either precision medicine, i.e. many patients like me, instead of just the same technology being presented to everybody, you'll see precision medicines or precision technologies that are catered to the profiles of the individual patient between, uh, uh, depending on how you actually, uh, how your makeup is. Uh, and I'm, um, I'm having in, immense fun working on these behavioral aspects uh, these days within cardiometabolic diseases and how to characterize patients based on these and how to turn these characteristics into helping tools for patients. Okay, yeah, uh, so precision medicine is like a, a huge thing and I can see how having like that personal experience is going to, as yeah. well as is going to be necessary if you've got like your own personal uh, medicine plan, medical plan. Uh, okay. Uh, do I have, uh, you, do, do you have anything to add on that? Like how is, um, AI going to help patient interaction? I mean, I think that as patients, we're all quite different, right? The way that, that Gabrielle may want to interact with his HCP or Christian may, it might be quite different than what I'm looking for. Right. Um, and I think this ability to really curate the experience, right. If I'm able to get a little bit more of an interaction with my HCP in a way, like we're all seeing, um, you know, whether it's electronic health records or, or the ability to chat or, you know, new ways and new channels to interact. I think that that is an extremely exciting, um, channel um, and, and, and opening up, um, I think, the availability of healthcare um, and, and um, access for patients so that more patients can be seen and be seen in a way that I want to be seen. So whether I want to do an electronic consultation, whether I want to, you know, send my 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 doc uh, a message in a photo, right? So obviously lots of um, security and, and responsibility items coming up as we're thinking about new channels. But, but I'm really excited about the idea that it, it doesn't don't have to think about this traditional idea of a patient going in and having an in in person um, interaction. And I think COVID taught us a lot, but I think that revolution continue to be one that's more and more curated. There's Absolutely. actually, you know, are we there? There's there's publications out there saying that the AI coming out of LMs in terms of how patients feel, seen, and heard, the LMs beat the hell out of doctors which is a scary thought, but, but oh, something they're trained to be nice, right? <laughs> they always have to be polite. Um, excellent. Yes. Yeah, so many opportunities here. And again, I feel like we could uh, talk about this for a long time, but we have, uh, I think one minute left. So final question from Lucas, what will be farmers approach towards predictive maintenance implementation? Oh, so yeah. Um, is all this air stuff, is it going to be built in house or are you going to buy it in? That's a tracy that's question. Tracy I think you need, I mean, it, it, I think it's going to be uh, mixed, right? Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to be a, a really lousy purchaser. 
So pharma needs to have uh, capabilities themselves that are then augmented by partners. That, that would be my prediction. Yeah. Innovate where you can be differentiated. Definitely don't innovate where you see larger providers and in, in the in the manufacturers and you know the I, I think every organization is is getting AI embedded, right? So whether it's software, hardware, sensors, et cetera, we're seeing that there's AI inside. So so ensure that your investments are in, in places that are truly differentiated to you or your business and allow the the core to be something that you leverage as soon as it, it is possible. All right, super. That seems great advice. Uh, you've got to have some skills in house and then, uh, yeah, maybe buy in the stuff extra. We're going to have to wrap it up at this point. Uh, thank you to all three of you. That was absolutely fantastic. I felt like we could have gone on for another hour there. There's like such a, such great content. Uh, before everyone dashes off, I just want to say if you're interested in this, we do have another session next Thursday on building a data literate workforce in healthcare. So uh, that's going to be really fun for you to come along to go, go to datacamp.com slash webinars to register for that. Uh, so yeah, just uh, thank you once again, Christian, Gabriel, Tracy. Uh, Thanks so good. <laughs> Thanks for thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, Reese, for moderating. Thank you to everyone who asked a question. Thank you to everyone who showed up today. See